Do you know that Jesus can do that? That he can wash you white as snow and the stains, whatever they might be, whatever they've been, whatever you walked in here with, can be uh, wiped clean? Do you know that today? That he, he wants to set you free, he wants to make you new, he wants to... Uh, I, I find great hope in that because I don't know about you, maybe, maybe you have nothing that needs cleaned up, but I do. Amen? Amen. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're like, yeah, we know you do. Yeah, we know you do. We know you do. Um, hey, this, sun, this Wednesday, I want to invite you to a special event. Um, you have two opportunities this, this Wednesday to celebrate what, what's called Ash Wednesday. And if you've never been a part of an Ash Wednesday service, I invite you to come and be a part of that. Uh, you'll see uh, in our bulletin uh, there is some information about that. We are going to have two opportunities for you to worship. Uh, Ash Wednesday kicks off a season called Lent. And if you're not familiar with what Lent is, it literally means, technically it means spring. And it is the season leading up to Easter. Traditionally, throughout Christian history for the last 2,000 years, Lent was a time leading up to Easter where you prepared yourself to be baptized. If you were going to get baptized on Easter, meaning signifying your, your dying to the, your old life and being raised new to new life, you would prepare during that season over a period of 40 days to uh, get ready for that. So you would spend a time of prayer and fasting, uh, devotion time, serving, you would uh, prepare yourself for baptism. So it became known as Lent, and it became a season of, of typically surrendering something, giving something up, denying something, serving in some way. And we kick it off with Ash Wednesday, and you'll have two opportunities that day to worship. One will be at noon here in the sanctuary. So if you have a lunch hour or can get free for lunch, uh, come on out at noon. It'll be a, will be a, a short 30-minute service, and uh, you'll get an opportunity to come and pray. We'll, uh, you'll, you'll get what we call imposition of the ashes, and so we'll place a, an ash in a form of sign of a cross on your forehead. Why do we do that? We sang a song about how God uh, takes what's dust and, and, and makes things new, and he makes beautiful things out of the dust, and he makes um, uh, life come where there is death. The ash represents, in the Bible, it represents repentance. It re represents turning away from an old life and going to a new life. And so we mark ourselves with the sign of the cross and with ash to signify that we are, we are a creature, we're created, and I'm not God. I'm not God. I need to be marked every now and then to be reminded I am not God. Anyone else feel that? You ever wake up and you feel like, I'm, I, I think I can handle today, but I'm just fine on my own. Right? I need to be reminded that I am not God. And I, I believe we all do. So Ash Wednesday, is, it's, it's, a, it's a somber time of, of reflecting on our own need uh, for our Creator. And so I invite you to come out. Noon will be here. And then if you can, if you can make it, at 5 o'clock we'll be leaving here and going up to Cokesbury for a service at there, there which starts at 6.30. And uh, you can, if you drive yourself, there's an address. I believe it's in the bulletin. It is. And uh, uh, you can call me or talk to me. If you want a carpool, if you need a ride, talk to me, and we will arrange for that to happen. But we're gonna, a group of us are going to go up and worship there at 6.30, and uh, it's going to be awesome. So I uh, invite you to come to one of those two events at, on Wednesday for Ash Wednesday. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you uh, that you are here with us today. God, as we open your word now to uh, the Gospel of John and we ask that you would reveal yourself to us, that you would speak into our lives, that you would open our eyes, Lord, that we would see you fresh and new. God, we pray that you would move in our hearts today. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're in this series called Reveal. We started last week. We're going through the Gospel of John each week. Last week we did chapter 1. This week we're doing chapters 3 and 4. We're not going to be able, in the, we're, we're going to be in John up through Easter, so in that time we're not going to, there's no way we can hit everything. So I hope you're going to our online uh, website and you'll see some sermon study guides there. Uh, each week you'll see something, there's some discussion questions, some things that you can get 
uh, get plugged in and, and find, uh, go deeper and, and, and hit some of the things that we're not going to be able to hit every Sunday. So I hope you'll make use of that. If you need some help with that, just ask and we'll, we'll make sure that that happens to you. Uh, I, 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 go, I was in Walmart the other day. Uh, I feel like I live in Walmart. Uh, I'm convinced that Walmart is one of those uh, rings of purgatory. Uh, it is, uh, if, if you do bad in this life, you're going to end up in Walmart for a period of time. I don't know how long. I know it's, I'm sure it's somewhere in the Bible. Um, but, uh, but so, so Walmart, but, but wherever it is, whether it's Walmart or in Bilo, here's, here's just, here's a public service announcement to you. If you ever see me in Walmart or Bilo or any store, do not go to the checkout line I go to. Okay? I'm just telling you right now. Do not go to the checkout line I go to. Because here's what I do when I go shopping. I, 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 maybe you're like me. I, I go down and I look at all the lines and I, I, I size up what everyone in front of me has in their carts, right? And I try to decide who is going to take the longest to check out. Now, not only, now I'm so weird that not only do I look at how much stuff is in your buggy if you're in front of me, but I also eye up the cash year, the, the person running it. And I want to see, like, do they look competent? Do they look like they know what they're doing? Are, are, they, are they quick on the draw? Are they, are they going to get the person through quickly? Because I want to find the line that's the fastest that I can get through, all right? Now, here's the deal, though. Here's why you do not want to go in the line I pick. I am always wrong. <laughs> 100% of the time, I pick the wrong line. So if you get behind, I, I, in fact, I do this all the time. I apologize to people behind me. I, I get in line, I, they get behind me, I go, man, you picked the wrong one, buddy. I'm going to be here forever. And uh, uh, you want to get into another line because I always pick the wrong one. That's just a public service announcement. Um, no, but while being in line forever, there's these magazines on the racks, right? You've seen these. And... Uh, um, I, I get a chance, I don't read them, I, I, I try to avoid them, but you can't sometimes avoid just seeing the headlines on these magazines. And looking at the headlines on the magazines and a Walmart checkout counter just reminds me of how much the world needs Jesus. Amen? Amen. I mean, there is uh, headline after headline after headline of, of people uh, broken, hurting, uh, trying to reinvent their lives through uh, another spouse, another boyfriend, another girlfriend, another job, another more money here, more of this there. I'm, we're trying and trying and trying. And, and every time I walk through that checkout line, I'm like, are you serious? I thought you were just with another, you were just married to someone else last month. And now it's someone new. It's, and, and this ongoing, I'm trying to reinvent myself. I'm trying to get my life in order. And nothing seems to be working for any of these people. Right? I mean, it, it, it's like, it's just this constant merry-go-round of, I'm trying to get my life, I'm trying, I'm pursuing this thing, I'm pursuing this happiness, I'm pursuing this, this, and, and, and there's just so much pain and brokenness there. It just tells me just how much the world is in need of something deeper. The world is in need of Jesus. So, um, our, our first, if you've got your notes, I want to invite you to follow along here. Uh, we're in John chapter 3 and 4. And here are two stories. We're going to be looking at primarily the story of Nicodemus, a religious leader, a, religi uh, a person who's been in church all his life, who knew the law, who knew how to do things. He was a good guy, right? We're going to be looking at him, and we're going to be looking at another woman in John chapter 4. She's known as the woman at the well oftentimes. Uh, she's a Samaritan woman. She's like the opposite of Nicodemus. She's the one who doesn't get it right, who's had sort of a checkered past, who, who doesn't have things together, who, who isn't connected to the church, who isn't uh, part of the religious circles, and so forth. We're going to look at both of these people and see, uh, find out some things that they both have in common, okay? They both have in common. And one of the, one of the things that pops out to me is this, this difference between reinventing our life versus rebirthing our life. There's a difference between always trying to reinvent my life versus rebirth, which is both of these stories talk about. To reinvent is what these folks on the front covers of magazines 
are trying to do, and it's what you and I often, if we're honest with ourselves, try to do. We just don't have the kind of money that they have to be on in front of People magazine, all right? But we're always trying to reinvent ourselves, aren't we? We're always going after that next thing. We're always busying ourselves with, if I just do this, if I just, you know, I'll, I'll make a New Year's resolution. This, I, I'm going to change the color of my hair. I'm going to join the YMCA. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to get some new friends. I'm going to move. I'm going to get a new job. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm, and we're so busy as a people. We're so busy trying to reinvent ourselves, trying to get ourselves better, trying to make life more manageable for ourselves. And here, in, in the midst of all this, is this guy named Nicodemus. And, and he walks up to Jesus in, in the middle of the night. It's dark outside because he doesn't want anyone to see him. He doesn't want anyone to know that he, though he's a part of the church, he's coming and, and, and he's been doing this and he doesn't know. There's something about this Jesus that he sees that is, is attractive to him. And so he comes to Jesus and, and he says, hey, Rabbi, Listen, we know that God has sent you. I'm in verse 2 in chapter 3 if you're following in your Bible. Rabbi, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. You, you hear in Nicodemus here this, Hey Jesus, I get you. I know you. I know who you are. Um, and, and hey, I, I, I really think you're kind of cool, Jesus. You do some pretty neat things. You do some great things, Jesus. We okay. Uh, we, we're, we're okay with that. We know who you are. It's, it's the church card, right? I, I, I know Jesus. He does some great things. In fact, I even do some neat things with him sometimes. We partner together. He, he, we do some great stuff. You're doing some miraculous stuff, Jesus. And, and that's obvious. It, it's, it's obvious that because you do this, God's with you. And that's awesome. And I just want to applaud you, Jesus. You're a good, great guy. And Jesus, he doesn't miss a beat. Listen to what Jesus says to him. It, it's like, he, no, no thank you, no, hey, that's great. Come on, I'm, I'm, I'm happy you noticed that. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 3. I tell you the truth, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Man. Jesus has a way of just cutting through all the layers of, hey, let's play church here and let's talk about how nice Jesus is and let's get to the bottom and the heart of it. Unless you're born again, Nicodemus, unless you have something supernatural happen inside your life, unless you are made brand new, unless the Spirit breathes into you, unless you do this, this whole working out your whole religion thing and going to church and getting better and reinventing yourself, it's not going to cut it. You're not going to have any part with me. You're not going to have life with me. You're not going to really see me. Now, this is really good news for those of you and us who have been trying to reinvent ourselves again and again, or we've been floundering through life on our own power. We've been trying, and we just keep on failing. We keep hitting up against the wall. It's good news because there is a power greater than you at work that wants to do this for you. <coughs> you didn't hear me. It's good news because there is a power at work in this world. His name is Jesus Christ, working by the Holy Spirit at work in your life to want to make you brand new. Amen. To not just make you do some better things, to be able to reinvent a life, to niche out and carve out some happy sort of lifestyle for yourself. This God wants to come in and completely clean house renovate everything, start from the ground up, and create in you a brand new heart. That's good news for us, whether we're trying to reinvent ourselves and just make ourselves more comfortable, or whether we've been in the gutter and in the barrel and really down under, and we know that nothing seems to be working very well. And the only thing you have to do today, you don't have to do, you don't have to plan it, you don't have to call your barber and get a new hairdo tomorrow. You don't have to get a new job tomorrow. You don't have to get uh, move to a new town, move to a new state. You don't have to do any of these things. You don't have to try to do anything more than for today just to surrender. Just surrender. Raise your white flag and say, I'm done trying to fix myself. I give the keys of my life over to you. 
Surrender. I'm done fighting. I'm done striving. Jesus goes on in verse 6 to say, Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. You know, humans, you and I are, you know, we're human. You knew that, right? Yes. Humans produce human life. I don't, don't miss what Jesus is saying here. Because you and I, we know what sort of life humans produce, right? No, and I'm not talking about babies. I'm talking about sometimes the life we produce as humans, it can be pretty good. I mean, we can, we can get, um, sort out, you know, a, a life that looks good, really good on, on Instagram or Facebook. Looks really good on Twitter or Twitter. <laughs> we, you know, we, 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 can, we can etch out a life that looks pretty good. We can etch out a life that looks that has a nice 401k building up. It, it's got a good job, a good home. We take a vacation every summer. And to other humans, it looks pretty good. And other times, that life that we etch out as humans, it can be pretty miserable, though, right? It can also be pretty miserable. It can be on the other side of the extreme. I remember when I was sitting in, in rehab three years ago, a little over three years ago now, because the human life that I was producing was killing me and killing everyone else around me. The human life that I was producing and was involved in and tied up in and consumed by was destroying me. And it was destroying every relationship I was in. And until my counselor, you know, so much so that my counselor said to me, hey Chad, guess what? Your best thinking got you here. You ever feel that way? Yeah, my best thinking, the, the best way that I could plan this whole human life out, the best way that I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the best I can, and here I am at the bottom. I'm in the gutter. I've really ruined it. I've really messed it up. There's brokenness all around. It's inside of us. It's what the Bible calls sin. And left to itself, left untouched, left unchanged, it will continue to produce the human life that only we can produce. And Jesus is saying there is another life, a life that is produced by the Spirit, a brand new life, completely transformed and new, that only being reborn can do. So how do you know if you've been reborn? How do you know if you've had this touch, if you've been breathed into and new life is developing in you. How do you know? Because that's, isn't that the golden question? Isn't that what we all want to know? Is well, how do I know that I, I've been there? Here's a, here's a couple ways that you can tell. Not all of them, but a couple. Do you have a hunger and thirst to fall more in love with God and with your neighbor? Do you, do you, is there a, a desire within you to know God and to be right with God? Do you desire Him? Are you falling more in love with Him as time goes on? Are you wanting to be and spend more time with Him? Is Jesus becoming an ever-increasing part of your life? Is Jesus becoming an ever-increasing part of your life, or has somewhere along the way, has it stalled or grown stagnant, maybe plateaued? Are the needs of others becoming an ever-increasing burden on your heart? Is that happening? I see it here. I see, I see signs of life and of rebirth all the time around here. And I see people getting involved in, in people's lives, whether it be in recovery at Dayton here on Thursday nights, or whether it be in our, our cold weather shelter, or many of the other things that we are doing as a church and that you are doing as individuals in, in your communities and in your places of work and, and, and business and families and friends and so forth. I see that happening all the time. Do the needs of others put a burden on your heart? Do you, do you find that these things, these things which the Spirit produces, are growing in you? Things which are mentioned in Galatians 5.22. Love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
These are called the fruit of the Spirit. And, and new life that is born of the Spirit will produce these fruits. And do you find yourself growing in these? Do you have a hunger and a thirst to see God's will done on earth as it is in heaven? Do you desire to see God made famous in this world and in this community? Can you imagine what it would look like if every church and every Christian were 100% sold in and bowed to, the, bowed to Jesus and wanted to see his will done and not our own will done? I believe the homelessness in Ray County would not even be an issue, right? I mean, it'd be gone. Uh, their marriages would be restored. We see families coming back together. We would see children who are not living without parents. We would see orphans who are being taken care of. We would see widows who are being taken care of. We would see uh, a dramatic decrease in crime and, and poverty and hunger and homelessness. Wars would cease. I mean, if every Christian in every church actually bowed to what Jesus wants us to be as Christians, it would change the world. And I believe as a church, as Mountain View, what we're called to do is to do just that. To be people who bow to Jesus and who want to see what he wants done, done. And be having the courage to step out to do those things. That's what Jesus told us to do. So, if those things are happening in you, then there's a good chance you've been born again. If, you, if, if you're moving in that direction, you can have assurance today that you've been born again. I want to talk about what if not, or what do I need to do, or what, let, let's say, let's say you're, you're, you're sort of uh, stalling on some of those questions. Maybe, maybe today you've, been, you've come here today and, and, and it hasn't been so good for you. You need to know this. You need to know that surrender and surrendering to Jesus is painful. It's painful. When we look at John chapter 4, we're going to look at this, the, the woman at the well. You see, Nicodemus comes to Jesus as, as a religious teacher who seems to have it all together. He came at night, scared of what others would think. And the woman who comes to the well uh, and meets Jesus, she's doing the very same thing. Only she comes in the middle of the day. She comes at noon. And she comes at the hottest time of the day to draw water. Why would she do that? Because she doesn't want anyone to see her. I, I used to live in the Middle East, and, and you don't want to go out in the middle of the day. You would do your work outside in the morning or in the evening when it was cool. And, and this woman comes at noon to come and draw water because she knows no one else will be there. They've already come either early in the day or late at night. She doesn't want to be seen. And, and watch, watch how what happens when she meets Jesus. She meets Jesus and Jesus asks her for a drink of water. He's alone there at the well. The disciples have gone off to find some food. And, and verse 9 in chapter 4, the women, woman was surprised because Jews usually refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. And so she says to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And they have this conversation, a fascinating conversation, where Jesus says, you know, if you knew who I really was, it would be you who is asking me for a drink. You'd be wanting to get something from me if you knew who I was. And they have this back and forth, this conversation, where this woman very craftily deflects everything that Jesus brings at her. She doesn't want to get near what is going on inside of her because it's too painful for anyone to see. And Jesus calls out her. He calls out, he says, listen, I know who you are. I know who you are. I know why you're coming here at noon. I know why you're coming here in the heat of the day to avoid being seen by anyone, but here I am and I see you. And he says to her, go call your husband. And just like that, she's disarmed. Because if you know the story, you know that she doesn't have a husband. She's actually had five husbands. And the man she's now living with is not her husband. And she's ashamed of this. You see, she's been trying to reinvent herself five different times in the arms of somebody else. 
And each time it just sends her deeper and deeper into this, this pit of shame and guilt and despair. I don't have a husband. Jesus says, I know. I know you don't. In fact, I know that you've had five. He sees her right where right she is. And then listen to what she does. <coughs> what you and I are so experts at doing. She then wants to have a conversation about where is the correct place to pray. You see this? Verse 19. You must be a prophet. Jesus has just told her the deepest, darkest secret of her heart. The thing she doesn't want anyone to know. The thing she wants to run away from. The thing she's trying to avoid having a conversation about. And so here's what her response is. I see your prophet. So tell me, why is it that Jews insist that Jerusalem's the only place of worship while we worship here on this mountain where our ancestors worship? You see the deflection here? The, the hey, let's not talk about what's inside of my heart. Let's talk about, let's talk about church. Let's talk about the right place to pray. Let's talk about theology. Let's have a discussion about things that are outside of there because I don't really want to have this discussion about me and my past and my husbands and, and my pursuit of, uh, of wanting to be connected and wanted and loved and liked. I don't want to talk about any of that. Let's talk about prayer. You ever do that? Yeah. I, I run into folks all the time who... Uh, whether it be in recovery or whether it just be in regular, everyday life, and, and we start talking about some of the things that are really important. You get, start getting to the, start undercovering the layers that are under there. Why do I do what I do? Why am I, why am I hurting in the way I'm hurting? And they'll start wanting to, they'll want to debate the Trinity. They'll want to debate um, what denomination I'm a part of. They'll want to debate this or that. And, and it's like all of this stuff on the outskirts, and none of it gets to the heart of the matter. None of it addresses the real need of what's going on inside. And the fear that this Samaritan woman is having is the fear of, what if I'm found out? What if you see me for just who I am and you don't like me? What if you see me for who I really am, and you don't like me. Don't we all live there at some point or another? Don't we all enter that place at some point or another? What if you see me and you don't like me? I read this last night in a book by Leslie Weatherhead. It's called, um, How Can I Find God? And he writes this sentence, which I think is on the, on the screen behind me. In a word, we are hiding from God, we who pretend to be seeking Him. Lest, yielding to Him utterly, in other words, <coughs> surrendering completely and giving Him everything, He should ask us to become more than we dare to be. What a powerful statement about getting to the bottoms of some of our fears I don't want to completely surrender to God because it's so painful because he's going to start to see and look at the stuff that's underneath there, the things I've done, where I've been, what I've, what I've lived through, and I don't know that I can handle that. And Jesus says to you here today, he says, hey, I see your past. I see your hurt. I see the grief that you're clinging to in your heart. I see the pain that you've been through. Perhaps it's over something your father or your mother did to you when you were young or a friend or a family member or someone you were close to. I see it. I see that. He says to you today, I see the thing that you run to every time that you're alone or you feel scared or you're angry or you're happy or you're joyful or you're bored. I see it. He says, I see to you today, I see that pill that you swallow, I see that bottle that you drink, I see that porn that you look at, I see it. I see that person you run to and get all consumed into because you feel very much alone and you're afraid of being alone. I see it. I see where your thoughts go when you're by yourself. 
I see the anger that's boiling up inside of you, and it comes out in times at rage with others that are close to you. I see it. It says, I see the fears that you have of doing anything new, of taking a risk, of stepping out in faith. I see it. I see the fears you have of getting cancer, or not having enough when you retire, or getting sick, or losing a family member, <coughs> or of dying yourself. I see that fear. I see it inside you. I see it. He says, I see how you keep yourself busy so that no one can really get to know the true you. Always going, always going. I see that your real love is money and possessions and career and status. And that if you lost that, you would feel like you've lost everything. I see your past. I know what you've done. I know what you've thought. I know what is going on. I see your dreams. And I see your lack of dreams. I see it. And each of us have to come to that place at the well, just like the woman at the well did is here, and allow Jesus to see us for who we really are, allow him to love us as we truly are. And that's exactly what he says to us. He says, look, I'm here, I see you, and guess what? Here's the good news. Despite all of that, in fact, because of all of that, I'm here. Because of all of that, I'm standing here today. Because of all of that, I had this divine appointment with you at this well, at this spot of your brokenness, at this spot of your deepest fear and pain and hurt. I had this divine appointment to meet you here today to tell you this, that I love you and that you are worth dying for. That's what he wants you and I to know today. And that's good news. And it's crucial that you and I come to grips with this fact that Jesus looks into the deepest recesses of our heart and sees the pain and the fears and the things we don't want to let anyone else see that we come to at night or we come to in the heat of the day in order to avoid. And he says, I love you. I want to make you new. If you'll surrender and just give it all to me. Let go of it. Lay down your life and follow me. Surrender is painful because it reveals the deepest parts of who we are. And it gives it over to someone else to control and to be a kingdom. The third thing, we need to move quickly here, surrender is daily. It's not just a one-time thing. It's, it, it's not just a, uh, well, I did it several years ago. Surrender is a daily, ongoing thing. Jesus said to the crowd in Luke 9, He said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, what's the word? Daily, daily and follow me. Daily surrender. Daily give it up to God and allow Him to be the Lord of those things in your life which are most keeping you in bondage. Daily. A daily dependence on God. And this um, this is why the season of Lent is just, I, I think, such an important time for the Christian to, to immerse himself. I love, I need this. I need a season of reset. You know? That's what Lent is for me. It's a reset button. Anyone need a reset button in life? Or wish you had one? I... I mean, I know we talk about like the Staples easy button, like boom, that'd be awesome too. I would love one of those. But I need a reset button. I need a time where I can recalibrate my life and line it back up with what, what it, where it is that I need to be with God. And Lent offers me that, that rhythm. Every year it comes around. Ash Wednesday, I get to come and I get to kneel down and have some ash marked on my head and say, hey Chad, you are not God. I, the last year, you've been picking up some pretty bad tendencies and some bad habits and some bad things and, and trying to control things and do things your way and, and trying to fix and manage things and trying to reinvent yourself. Hey, Chad, here's a mark. You ain't God. You're powerless. I have the power, God says. 
And, and then as I rise up with that mark on me, and then I enter into the season of Lent, I begin to feel God's presence empowering me, energizing me to be able to give up some of the things that have been sort of holding me and, and getting me dragged down into the ways of the world. Things that have been holding me back. I had a, um, Lent's a great time for you to give up something. And, and, and don't, here's a, just a suggestion, all right? This is, this, is, this is Chad talking. Don't give up chocolate if you don't eat chocolate all the time. <laughs> All right? I, I, people would say, I'm giving up chocolate. Well, how often do you eat chocolate? Well, I'll, I'll get it like once in a while. I'll splurge. <laughs> well, that ain't your thing. No. Find something that is, is, is distracting you and keeping you from walking with God and, 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 and say, I'm going to give this over to you, God. I was having a conversation with some, some gentlemen this past week who are trying to uh, find some freedom from their pornogra online pornography addiction. And uh, tremendous courage to come forward. And, and listen, guys, if you're, if you're here and you're struggling with that, you're not odd because you're struggling with that. You're odd if you step out and say, hey, I'm struggling and I want help. Amen? What makes you odd is not that you're having this struggle. What makes you odd is not that you're having any struggle at all. All of us are having struggles. What makes you odd and why we say every Thursday night, hey, if you're here on Thursday night seeking recovery, you're one of the most courageous people in Ray County. We tell them that every week. And if you come Thursday night, you'll hear that too. You're one of the most courageous people in the county for saying, hey, I'm struggling with something. I've got something in my life I want to be free of. I want to have support and I want to be enabled by, by some higher power greater than me. Many of the folks who come here on Thursday night, they don't even know what that is yet. But they come to learn that one day that's going to be Jesus. He's going to come into their lives and change everything. They're going to be born again. So, um, back to what I was saying. These, these gentlemen who were wanting to be free, we were talking about, well, what is it that trips you up? Well, um, Twitter. I, I see this stuff on Twitter. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Cut it out of your life. Take these 40 days of Lent and say, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to cut it out of my life. I'm going to surrender it. I'm going give to it, give it up to God and see what he does with that. And watch him work in that. Um, it's worth it. It's worth it. If, if, if you're struggling with something that's, not, that's holding you down and you want to be free of it, Lent is a wonderful time to say, hey, I'm going to do some, I'm going to rearrange some of my priorities in life and allow God to breathe new life into me through through these steps. Um, on the back of your, your notes, there is the mercy prayer. It's not something that is a stranger to, to you if you've been attending Mountain View Church for, for more than a year. But um, as I look out over here, many of you are new and you may not know the mercy prayer. Um, this is not the first time I've taught it and it won't be the last. This prayer changed my life. And, and I give it to you to put in your pocket and take with you and to pray it and make it a daily prayer. Maybe you, during Lent you want to pray this every day. Let it be the first words out of your mouth in the morning and let it be the last words out of your mouth at night. Pray it for your friends. Pray it for your spouse. Pray it for your enemies. Pray it for your uh, children. Pray it for yourself. Lord, life me is number five. Breathe new life into me. Make me reborn by the Spirit so that I'm no longer operating and creating human life. Let me create spiritual life breathed in by you. Life me, God. Life me. When I was uh, getting free myself, I prayed these prayers a thousand times a day, every day. I would go to bed exhausted because I'd been praying. But you know what? I went to bed victorious because I've been praying. And, and if you're struggling with something, if something is keeping you down, if something is, is holding you back, if you will pray, if you will commit to praying this prayer for 40 days, I'll promise you that your life will be brand new. I promise you that God will do a work in your heart that you can't do yourself. And it'll be amazing. And you'll see a freedom and a newness of life that you had not known before. Pray this prayer. Men. Guys, husbands, I want to challenge you, as a husband myself, I want to challenge you to pray this prayer for your wife. Pray this prayer over your wife every day during Lent. God, I pray that you would flood Amy with your knee-filling mercies. God, 
Give her what she needs. God, I pray that you would make Amy to know Jesus more. Make her to love you and to want to increase in the knowledge of you, God. I pray that you would make Amy poor in spirit. Lord, I pray that you would do it gently. Help her to see her neediness for you, God. God, I pray that you would fill Amy with your Holy Spirit. That you would immerse her in your spirit. Come to her in power and might. God, I pray that you would life Amy. Life her. Pour out your life-giving mercies into her soul. God, I pray you would bless Amy. Lord, bless her in everything she touches. Bless her spiritually, physically, and financially. Bless her loved ones. With me, I guess. Um, <laughs> do for her, Lord, <laughs> instead of me. See, now, now I got the guy's attention now. Like, oh, yeah, I'll pray that now. Yeah. <laughs> Lord, mercy, Amy, flood her with your need-filling mercies. Pour them out in superabundance. Find and meet every need in her life as you see it, Lord. Guys, can you imagine what would happen if you would pray that over your wife every day for, during that? And wives, I'll put that on you too. Imagine if you were to pray that every day over your husband over this next 40 days. Imagine if you were to pray that over the uh, checkout person in the counter who is going way too slow. Lord, mercy them, God. Bless them. Imagine if you would pray that over the person who cuts you off as you're leaving here to go to lunch in just a few minutes. Imagine if you would pray that for the person who is staying in our cold weather shelter tonight and the person who needs to be there this Thursday. Imagine if you would pray. Very quickly, the end to close. Surrender leads to new life. It leads to real life. Jesus replied to this woman at the well, anyone who drinks of this water will soon become thirsty again. That thing you've been running to over and over again, that way you've been trying to reinvent yourself, has it ever really satisfied? If you're honest with yourself, you know the answer is no. It just keeps on demanding and wanting more and more and more, and it will take everything until it leaves you with nothing. The waters of this world, the human life that we try to produce, will always leave us thirsty for more. You were created. You were created to be in a relationship with God. You were created to be in communion with Him. You were created to have this thirst for what only He can give. And the more we chase after other things, the more we find that we are left empty and we are left thirsty. And Jesus is saying, you can keep going after that, but it's just going to keep on making you more and more thirsty. Come to me because I have living water. Water that if you will take and drink of me, you'll never grow thirsty. And not only that, you'll have eternal life. You'll have a life that begins today, which will last for all of eternity. And it'll be new life. It'll be reborn of the Spirit. It'll be something you can't create or reinvent yourself. It'll be heaven sent. And it will be brand new. And it will be powerful and life-giving, not only to you, but everyone around you. They'll see it and they'll notice it. Because you know what? The great story about the Samaritan woman, she goes from this place of complete brokenness and complete fear of being who she is and exposing who she is. And she goes into town and she goes and tells everyone about this Jesus who said and knew her for who she was and loved her for where she was. And they all became Christians because of her testimony. They all came and said, hey, we want to know who this Jesus is. He's done something amazing in your life. Maybe he can do that in my life too. That's what Jesus wants to do in you today. And if he's done that in you, if you've been born again, that's what he's calling you to do, to go out and invite people to come and see you. She's, the, she's a great example of our first series in the Fry series of Get Jesus, Give Jesus. We talk about we need to get Jesus, and then we need to go out in the world and give Jesus away. She did that. And now may we who are born again go and give Jesus to others. Invite them to come and see what God is doing. Would you please stand? If you're thirsty today, if you've been, if you're just parched, and guys, there's no shame in it. I mean, 
Don't, don't leave these doors here today thinking, I don't want anyone else to know that I'm broken and that things aren't right in my life. Don't leave here thinking that there is any shame. Don't leave here like Nicodemus or the woman at the well showing up at night or in the middle of the day when no one will see. Because guess what, guys? Everyone here is broken. Everyone here is a sinner in need of Jesus. Every one of us are in need of this water that Jesus is freely offering here to you today. And as James sings, Oh, how he loves me, he's looking into your heart today and he's saying, I've got water that you can't buy at Walmart. I want to give you something that will give you life eternal. Would you come and just feast on him today and drink from his waters today? This altar is open. Jesus is here. The names on these boards are here to be prayed over. If you want to come and pray, write a name on there. If you want to put your own name on there, great. Come and drink from the water that will never go dry. In Jesus' name.